welcome back to Eschatology Matters, and we have a really special uh, Eschatology Matters for you today. I've been looking forward to this chat for quite some time. So typically here on Eschatology Matters, our focus is more toward uh, the Reformed, or you could say covenantal leanings of eschatology. So that typically uh, you know, restricts the conversation partners that we enlist here on Eschatology Matters. Um, but I'm, I'm really encouraged today we get to jump into a conversation on the history of dispensationalism, how dispensationalism has developed, some of those historical mile markers. And I've got two subject matter experts experts that are joining me today. So um, Drs. Corey Marsh and Daniel Hummel, thank you guys so much for joining me today. Very happy. Pleasure to be here. Absolutely. Um, Corey, you logged on first, so I'm going to ask you to just go ahead and uh, give a little bit of introduction um, where where you are, where you're teaching, and kind of how you've uh, entered into this field. Yeah, thank you, Josh. I, I certainly appreciate our friendship over the years and the invite to be here on Eschatology Matters and I certainly find it, uh, uh, I'm very honored that I get to purify your podcast with premillennial <laughs> dispensational truth. <laughs> I'm uh, just kidding. All, <laughs> all kidding aside, I, I do appreciate Eschatology Matters and uh, your own scholarship and the conversations that have come out of this podcast. So I'm, I'm, I'm definitely honored to be here. As for me, um, I am Dr. Corey Marsh. I serve as professor of New Testament at Southern California Seminary, which is a, uh, a smaller seminary down in East County, San Diego, uh, El Cajon, to be exact. It falls under the leadership of Shadow Mountain Community Church, where David Jeremiah, a prominent Southern Baptist pastor, is the pastor um, of that particular church. And uh, I've been a full-time professor there at SCS for seven years, I believe. I had gotten my, uh, I was a former student, so my my MABS, Master of Arts in Biblical Studies, my MDiv, and my THM were at SCS. And then I went to Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary for my PhD, which, uh, Josh, where you and I met, and we got sure. to share some fun seminars together. Uh, my PhD is in Biblical Theology, and uh, I also have the privilege of serving as scholar-in-residence at my local church, which is Revolve Bible Church in San Juan Capistrano. Uh, which is a nice way to be able to be a bridge between the church and the academy uh, in that particular deacon role that I have. I'm at home right now. My wife, Shannon, and I, we're high school sweethearts. Uh, we're going on 14 years of marriage. Actually, next week will be our 14th anniversary. We live in Mission Viejo, which is about maybe an hour and a half, two hours away from FCS. So I, I drive uh, the five south down in traffic. And if anybody's familiar with Southern California traffic, it is atrocious. It is one of my go to arguments that we cannot be in the kingdom of God right now because of the traffic is so bad. <laughs> uh, let's just start there. I hope there's no traffic in the kingdom, but uh, uh, yeah, so this is about an hour and a half away. And, and I live, we live in Mission Viejo. And um, yeah, I think that's a little bit about me. I've, I've published a few books and some articles. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll send it over to Dan. Great. Well, it's good to be with both of you. And right off the front, um, uh, Josh said Corey logged on first. That's because we had a schedule mix up and I wasn't even on for a while. So I, I thank you to both of my colleagues here for their patience uh, for me getting on here. Um, uh, yeah, I'm uh, I'm here in Madison, Wisconsin. I'm Dr. Dan Hummel. Um, I, uh, I'm i sure Corey and I have a lot of actual shared um experiences shared beliefs uh but we have very different educational uh backgrounds which um uh will come through just shortly so um i grew up in a in a missionary family and i moved uh, i lived in germany for a while as a kid i was actually born in orange county so i have family in the southern california area go back there most years um my dad worked at biola uh, for a good number of years until recently as well and i have a lot of family that has gone to biola um, I went to my, I, I grew up in Colorado after that and went to Colorado State University for my undergraduate and master's. My undergraduate was in philosophy and history. I, I double majored and then I got a master's degree in history. And I was really focused on history of the Middle East, actually, and particularly U.S. foreign relations and the Middle East, modern Middle East. And then I came to UW, uh, Madison, University of Wisconsin-Madison in 2010. Uh, I initially planned to do a dissertation on uh, the neoconservative movement, um, a, a particular type of political intellectual movement in U.S. politics. Um, but things changed and advisors changed and other things changed. And I ended up landing on um, a topic that was somewhat similar, combining foreign relations and religion for uh, talking about Christian Zionism. And that's what really got me interested in an academic study of theology um, and particularly evangelical theology. Uh, and so I, I finished my dissertation in 2016. 
um, published my first book, which was a version of my dissertation called Covenant Brothers, Evangelicals, Jews, and U.S.-Israeli Relations that looked at the Christian Zionist movement um, since basically the 1940s. And dispensationalism played a role, but actually one of my main points in the book was that people overstate the influence of dispensationalism to the story of Christian Zionism. Mm -hmm. And um, some of the research in that book um, made me interested in a broader history of dispensationalism. And I took up that cause after that and um, and then uh, published a book um, this year called The Rise and Fall of Dispensationalism, which I have to thank Josh. This is my third appearance on the podcast. I feel very honored um, to be on so many times. Um, and, uh, and, and that book um, has been out just a, just a few months now. So um, I am trained as an intellectual historian and a diplomatic historian and, um, and trained at a place like UW-Madison. So I've done a lot of work over the years to try to, um, on a personal level, integrate my faith with my scholarship in programs that that was not at all a priority. Uh, most, of the, most of my colleagues at UW-Madison were not Christian. I did not have any Christians on my uh, dissertation committee. And so I had to really work on on my own and with the help of my pastor and and campus ministry uh, people to really think about like how does my faith intersect with my uh, my scholarship. So I come at it from that perspective. I think as we talk, you'll see that I have certain sort of commitments as a historian that lead to a certain interpretation of uh, religious history of dispensationalism that might uh, not be shared by by everyone, but um, but that's my training and, and that's sort of how I approach these issues. No. So yeah, really really excited to be here. No, very cool. And Dan, I appreciate you uh, yeah bringing up the the three times on here. I was weighing at the front end if I could be an impartial fly on the wall to this conversation. I graduated with Corey, so I've heard Corey in the classroom yelling at me when I was wrong uh, with a biblical interpretation. But then on the other hand, you've been on the show three times, so I think it's going to balance out a little bit that 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 shared camaraderie that we have. Yeah, uh, you yeah, are... Dan, that should that should that should encourage you what he thinks of me. You've been on three times, and this is my first, right? <laughs> but he's known me for a while. What does that say about me? Uh... <laughs> Or does well, I say about his thought toward me? <laughs> yeah, we're, we're we're all we're all slow and learning, right? I'm getting there. Um, Dan, you were kind of jumping into what I was hoping to kind of introduce into because you both have written books. Um, both of them, well, I, I would label both scholarly treatments of the history of dispensationalism. Dan, you were kind of starting to go into that. Could you just kind of press in a little more on that, and then we'll go ahead and see back to Corey. Um, not only on the book you've written, but uh, on the approach and maybe how your scholarly training, your position there as a teacher, how that's kind of shaped part of that approach what makes that look different if you're the if you're the lay person in the pew you're trying to to understand where these these perspectives are coming from what what sort of book have you written and why yeah thanks josh and by the way i didn't even say where i'm working right now so i'm i'm in our offices here I'm, i work at a place called upper house uh, which is a christian study center serving university of wisconsin madison so you can think of us as a campus ministry with a building in a way we do a lot of the same things inner varsity or crew would do that we have our own take um on it but um, so I'm writing outside of the academy. I am affiliated with the history department here at UW, um, but I'm writing in some ways. Um, I, I definitely see what I'm doing as scholarship, but it's not necessarily within the bounds of of the academy, at least not my position. Hmm. But um, uh, in terms of the book, The Rise and Fall of Dispensationalism, I think the key thing, uh, it's, a, it's a history of dispensationalism starting in the early 19th century, particularly 1830, up to the present. I divide it into three sections or three parts um, one going from 1830 to 1900, another from 1900 to 1960, and then one from 1960 to, I, I think I end in 2020. Um, and, and so it's a narrative history. It traces, as the title says, my understanding of a development of a particular theological tradition uh, that is systematized, that sort of peaks in my telling around 1960, and then uh, has a, a, a decline, a fall. And um, I think I, I don't need to go through sort of blow by blow what the story is, but I think there's a few things I can say that that are distinctive from other histories of dispensationalism. Uh, one of them is I really am keyed into the differences between different strands of premillennialism, and this is a this is an a, an oversight, a a, simple, a a lack of insight by previous uh, historians who have who've written about this, sort of lumping all premillennialists into a one category and thus missing a lot of the actual drama of the story or the, or the developments 
um, of the story. I think another one is that dispensationalism as a tradition, and, and I'm, I'm talking the modern uh, dispensationalism here, I know we can get into um, the, the longer history, but at least in the 19th and 20th century, there's a scholarly or scholastic tradition, and then there's a more popular tradition. And there are definitely interactions between those traditions, um, but they are not uh, the same, and you shouldn't collapse them into a single tradition. And this is something that a number of historians have done over the past uh, generations as well. So even as I'm describing the book, you can tell my primary conversation partners for this are other historians of American religion. That's uh, what get, got me interested in the topic and, um, and really where I'm sitting um, sort of uh, methodologically. And mm -hmm. so what that means is I'm responding particularly to a, a number of recent books. Some of them might be familiar to people on the call and some might not. Um, the most recent sort of treatment of premillennialism was from 2014, the book called American Apocalypse by a historian named Matthew Sutton, which um, I really appreciated. It actually stimulated uh, a lot of thinking on my end, but I really disagreed with his lumping of all premillennialism into a single category and uh, largely collapsing scholarly conversations and popular conversations into a single uh, conversation. And there's a there's a sort of distinguished history of doing that type of work. My advisor, uh, the person who occupied the chair that she's in before her, was a historian named Paul Boyer, who wrote a book in the 90s called When Time Shall Be No More, that is basically still the go-to reference for historians on prophecy belief in American culture. That was another book that collapsed a lot of these distinctions that I wanted to make. So I was responding to those um, to those, I thought, oversights, and also trying to channel some of the, I think, really good new scholarship, including by Sutton and others, that uh, has given us a much better sense of dispensationalism within the modern era. So this is books uh, such as uh, Dispensational Modernism by Brendan Peach, which came out, I think, in 2015 with Oxford. Um, what really interesting book. It was a very narrow study of late 19th century dispensationalists, but was uh, had, had a lot of insights that you can see throughout my book as well. And then the last uh, sort of inspiration I'll, I'll cite is um, the historian Donald Atkinson has written, I think, three volumes now of basically a history of the Brethren movement and its early reception into the U.S., mostly centered on the 19th century. And Atkinson is someone I didn't really know about. He, he's a very prodigious historian. He's written a, a lot of books, but he only came onto my radar when he started writing books about Darby, uh, John Nelson Darby and some of the other brethren, brethren uh, about uh, eight or so years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I took a lot from those books as well. So I'm coming out of that. I think it's very clear. It should be clear to everyone uh, on here. I'm a historian, not a theologian. I am not competent to sort of debate the finer points of um, of covenant versus dispensational theology. Um, I, I have a particular way of doing history that's rooted in this training I have and these um, these books I've read and and uh, want to respond to. Hmm. Um, and and um, and I'm I'll just out myself. I, I'm not super invested in in a personal way the covenantalist versus dispensationalist categories. Um, I am. Uh, even I call myself an evangelical Christian. I have sort of lay interests in these things. You know, I read around these things. But when I talk as a historian, I'm not necessarily, though I'm sure plenty of dispensations read my book and think it's it's not uh, at all fair. Um, but I'm not necessarily trying to tip the scales to one side or the other. I'm trying it to my best ability, and I'm a flawed human being like the rest of us, to to call it as I see it, to tell a story that I think is is true to to reality. But I'm not someone who is trying necessarily to weigh in. And um, a lot of the conversation around the history of dispensationalism has really been wrapped up in, a, in, in debates between covenants and dispensationalists with a lot of sort of freight on uh, the meaning of certain <clears throat> conclusions about the history, that it's either legitimate or illegitimate. And I've realized since publishing the book that I've probably stepped on a few uh, conversations that I should have been more aware of um, as I was writing the book. But because of the things I was trying to respond to in the historiography I just mentioned, um, I made decisions that uh, could be you know, misinterpreted or it's my fault for writing it in a way that's that's unclear. Um, but uh, but yeah, so anyone on the call hoping I'm going to sort of defend the covenantalist position and uh, slap down a sort of I, I'm not competent to do that. that that's not what I'm going to be able to do. Uh, but I, I am pretty interested in the history and also interested in talking about uh uh, Corey's uh, edited volume, which really helped me uh, think through some finer points as well. Very good. No, that's that's a great segue. Corey, walk us into yours, the synopsis of your recent book, 
um, how it differs maybe in approach or in content. Uh, walk us into that a little bit, brother. Sure, I'd love to. And, and let me start by saying I, I have my copy of Dan's book here, The Rise and Fall of Dispensationalism. It was very insightful. There was, as Dan said, much that we would agree on. Um, however, there are places I would take exception, which will probably come out in this conversation, but it, it's very well written and enjoyable. Um, and so I appreciate his efforts there. Uh, probably, yeah, as you mentioned, so I'm the general editor of a new book that just came out, Discovering Dispensationalism. And our thesis is really captured in that subtitle, like any good academic scholarly book, right? Uh, tracing the development of dispensational thought from the first to the 21st century. So we make a distinction between dispensationalism as a system and dispensational thought, which are ideas and themes, say, to some parts of the whole. All right, so discovering dispensationalism, the main title is is really getting is what it's trying to get at is what are the ideas that would lead to this system, and that's what's captured in the subtitle, which is the thesis of our book, tracing the development of dispensational ideas and themes or dispensational thought from the first to the twenty first century. Um, you know, I'll start off with our book, Dan. I appreciated his introduction because he is a, a cultural intellectual historian. He's going to, his book um, analyzes dispensationalism from a historical perspective and how it was received and the impact that it's had within uh, broader evangelicalism, especially modern evangelicalism. Um, ours is different. Our angle is we're coming at it not so much as a cultural phenomenon, that is dispensationalism, uh, but uh, how it's, it's, do, it's tracing doctrinally how the beliefs that would later be codified under dispensationalism developed. So our book is not showing dispensationalists or dispensationalism as some type of social identity or cultural phenomenon. And I think that might be one of the pushbacks I would give on Dan's book, as good as it is. I don't think that's the correct, I don't think that's the most helpful way to analyze a theological system. I understand that, you know, I, as Dan said, he is a historian, he's a first rate historian. Um, oftentimes, though, it might becomes the escape hatch, if I may say that, for some historians to write on theology and then shy away from any theological debate or, or, or questions to their theology. When you're, when you're tracing history of a theolog theological system, there has to be some good firsthand uh, knowledge of the actual system of beliefs that you're dealing with. So ours is, is that very thing. It's a historical tracing of doctrinal development. And basically what we argue, the main thesis of our book, is that we argue for the historical veracity of dispensational thought. We're not saying the system of dispensationalism has always existed or the early church fathers would even call themselves dispensationalists in the modern sense of the term. That would be anachronistic. In fact, I think we use the term oftentimes in the earlier chapters of our book, proto dispensationalists or germinal dispensationalists. These type of thinkers that had ideas that would later be understood today as distinctly dispensational. Uh, so we argue for the historical veracity of dispensational thought. We're not giving a polemic for the truth. We're not uh, of the system or the value of it, although perhaps the last chapter might kind of start going that way. The very last chapter concluding summing it up and where dispensationalism today is. But the DNA of the book, it's arguing for the historical veracity of dispensational thought that basically these so-called dispensational ideas are not novel. They are not cultic. They certainly were not invented by one single man or a gentry class of Western thinkers in the 19th century. Uh, which makes us our book perhaps a little bit different on that side than, than Dan's book. Um, but the ideas that we're analyzing that are most prominent within dispensational thought today, we're going to say have existed throughout the history of the church. Dispensationalism did not invent these ideas. Rather, dispensationalism was formed by these ideas. And our method of doing that, I am a co I'm the co-general editor. My colleague, Dr. James Fazio, is the other general editor. We enlisted a dozen scholars, um, some of whom aren't even dispensationalists themselves. Um, many of them are, some of them aren't, but these are his active historians, professors, uh, theologians, and even biographers that were experts in particular eras in church history. And uh, what they do is the method is an honest, honest historical appraisal of primary evidence. Uh, basically, each chapter is going to analyze the theological ideas within a specific history or a specific era in church history that reflect uh, uh you know distinct what would later be understood as dispensational beliefs so from primary documents from the first century all the way to the modern times we trace historically where and when when these ideas emerged and how they found a home 
in what would later be called uh, dispensationalism. Uh, much like Dan's book, he, 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 he has a breakdown of three chapters or three movements, if you will, in the history of uh, modern dispensationalism. Our book is also broken down in three broad sweeps historically. That is dispensational thought in what we call ancient Mediterranean. So the time of the New Testament all the way up to the fourth century. So we're talking about the patristic era all the way to the Nicene era. Um, and then dispensational thought in what we call vintage Europe, the medieval times, often considered a nebulous dark period in history. What were, were there any dispensational ideas or thought in that particular era? Um, and all the way up to John Nelson Darby, which we can talk about later, his, his move, his place in the story. And then finally, our third part is dispensationalism in modern America. I believe that's how it's termed. And that's when you really see where dispensational thought takes different branches, different, different streams. It's not as monolithic as often uh, put and even as Dan brought up and other critiques of dispensationalism or history of even ideas like premillennialism is kind of lumped together with all these different things. Well, you see with dispensational thought in modern America, the different traditions and strands that have developed from these ideas that can be traced all the way back to the first century. So that's a little bit about our book. It's really a, a historical uh, a development or uh, a development of, of doctrine historical tracing of doctrinal development, the patterns of belief that would later be understood as dispensationalism. Gotcha. No, very good. Very, very helpful overviews of both of those works. Um, we have a couple of topics to walk through, and I'm, I'm going to ask us to just kind of do this. This isn't a formal debate. Um, we're not here to, to debate any topics per se, but we do want to discuss them. So um, we're going to bring up a couple of these topics just from the introduction. I suspect these are going to take a little bit more time than I thought they were going to. Uh, but what I'm going to ask you guys to do is just allow a little bit of time at the end, not for, again, you know, some sort of vitriolic debate, but as far as a little pushback or maybe even a little question, a um, little response from the other side at the end of these. But I'm going to ask you guys, and Corey, we'll start back with you. Um, um, and then go to Dan, defining dispensationalism. And I know that's kind of a tall task, but if we're thinking of defining the term, or maybe uh, insofar as you address the term, because I'm hearing a little differences in the way you guys are even approaching the term itself. Um, I, I know some of the things that uh, that we encounter, for example, in theological studies, um, some people will define dispensationalism as a hermeneutic, some will define it as primarily an eschatological position, and we could walk on down that line. Um, but I'm going to let you guys kind of define what your categories are as far as uh, what that is when you address dispensationalism dispensationalism, Corey? Sure. No, I appreciate that. So everybody, even within dispensationalism, you're going to have different definitions and descriptions, right, of, of any theological system of, within their within those adherents. Um, but basically, I would say that dispensation, well, let me start with this, dispensationalism, what it is not. One, to address what you said, Josh, dispensationalism is not a hermeneutic. Okay. In fact, we clearly say that in the final chapter of our book. There are two common errors, three, really, that seem to be corrected ad nauseum by dispensationalists because uh, they're constantly promulgated. And one is that dispensationalism is itself a hermeneutic. So it's imposed on the scriptures. Uh, the other big one, which is what we address head on in our book, that dispensationalism is new. It is recent. It's not more than 150 years old. Let's, let's trace it to John Nelson Darby or someone else, the scope of reference Bible, perhaps. Um, but that's another error. And three, dispensationalism is not a system. It's not a soteriological system. It does not address th salvation in any specific way. Those are mischaracterizations. Well, oftentimes you'll hear that dispensationalism teaches multiple ways of salvation, which could not be further from the truth. So those are things that dispensationalism is not. So what is dispensationalism? Well, I would say very, very simply, dispensationalism is a pattern of beliefs. Some might call it a framework. Let's go with a system of theology. Dispensationalism is a system of theology that results from a specific way of reading the Bible. And that specific way of reading the Bible is a consistent, what we call grammatical, historical hermeneutic. And so when you apply that interpretive methodology, that is a consistent, what we believe is a consistent literal hermeneutic, or to break down those components, grammatical and historical hermeneutic, from the first, uh, from Genesis all the way to Revelation, you're going to recognize as dispensationalism, the system does, various distinctions, not discontinuity, which is often the word that's used to describe dispensationalism, but distinctions, because there's a lot of continuity within the, the theology of dispensationalism, by the way. But we're, it's going to recognize various distinctions that the Bible itself makes throughout its own revealed canonical history. Uh, probably the, the, the two uh, biggest distinctions that we're known to make is between uh, programs for national ethnic Israel and there's a program for the church, 
So just there alone, we would say God has multiple peoples of God. Another distinction that dispensation was known to make, and this is, I'm speaking as a traditional dispensationalist. So there are some that are within progressive dispensationalism that might have a different take or take exception to some of what I'm saying, but I'll try to represent dispensationalism as a whole, but I can't help but, you know, be my particular, I'm, my particular focus would be a traditional, sometimes called normative, others call it classical. That's, that's a misnomer. I would say it's revised or traditional dispensationalism. Not only do we make a distinction between church and Israel, but we also make a distinction between the church and the kingdom of God. So we are futurists. We believe that, of course, God is on the throne. And if we're looking at the entire cosmos as his sphere of, of, of reigning, then yes, God reigns over everything. But specifically, Jesus, in accordance with prophecy, the Davidic kingdom, uh, Davidic covenant, Second Samuel 7 and elsewhere, he is going to uh, assume the Davidic throne in literal Jerusalem in a transitory, mediatorial, messianic kingdom that is still to come. So we look at that that future kingdom as the Lord taught us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. We're looking at it still future. So we make a distinction between church in Israel, church in the kingdom. And finally, we would look at all the biblical revelation, showing the philosophy of history throughout throughout the world, throughout world history, and as it's revealed in the canon, everything is to the glory of God. That is the purpose of all history, not merely as some some of our co uh, covenantal brethren would say, the redemption of the elect, everything is about salvation and redemptive history. We're saying it is much broader than that. Even salvation has a greater goal, and that is doxological. It is to the praise of God's glory. So God is, we would say, is as glorified as he, in, as he is with the redemption of the elect, as he is with his condemnation, uh, with those who are, um, who are judged, who are not part of the elect. He is glorified by nature. By um, by things just in the cosmos, he's glorified in his justice and his compassion. Everything is to the purpose. Uh, every perp everything has its purpose in the self glorification of God from Genesis to Revelation. So uh, that's that's my take on dispensationalism. How I would uh, describe it. It is not, and I would say this. And 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 Dan, I appreciated how he prefaced it. He is not a covenantal theologian. He's not trained in that. So I don't want to take this conversation between dispensationalism and covenant theology, because that is the two rival systems, if you will, within evangelicalism, at least the two most you know, classically understood. Um, but I will say this, is that dispensationalism, to go back on your question, Josh, about being a hermeneutic, this is one of the big distinctions. There's several, but this is where it starts. It's at the hermeneutical level. Dispensationalism does not see itself as a hermeneutic, contrary to covenant theology, uh, which I appreciate guys as brilliant as Michael Horton, probably maybe one of the best representatives of covenant theology, has no problem saying in an article, Modern Theology, his article uh, interpreting scripture by scripture, he has said that covenant theology can be read out of the scriptures and it could be imposed on the scriptures. And to a dispensational thinker, that's like nails on the chalkboard because we put so much emphasis on a literal consistent hermeneutic, which results in our pattern of belief or our framework or our theological system. It is not a hermeneutic in itself. So that's kind of a basic part right there, basic definition, if that helps, of, of how I understand dispensationalism. Oh, very good. Appreciate that, Corey. Um, Dan, well, let's do it this way. Maybe uh, any clarification or or, uh, or response from you, and then you can just kind of launch into the same same topic. No, I, I really appreciate it. I can just imagine some of the, the watchers just like, cringing that I have no rejoinders about. I don't even know exactly if covenantal uh, theologians take offense at being a, her a hermeneutic or not. I'm not sure. Um, so I'm just going to, I'm, I'm going to leave it there and say I, what I just heard is a, a, I, I, I resonate or I, I don't resonate with it, but I, I recognize a lot of that from, um, from the many dispensationalists um, I've read. I appreciate that Corey, you, you mentioned a number of different categories that have emerged really in the last few decades, normative, revised classical to try to make some sense of the history i think that's 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 when that was a really interesting development um, i think a lot of those terms go back to the 1990s and books by daryl bach and craig blazing and others who are trying to develop a sort of um historical understanding of at least the more modern um generations of dispensationalists and and what the differences were so um i, I appreciate that i think one thing i've realized as i've talked to people about this book i've gotten to do all types of conversations with dispensationalists and others is um is what I'm actually tracing in this book is is a little narrower than um than dispensationalism as a as a phenomenon or as a system. I'm really interested in a particular 
um, tradition of it that really traces through Dallas Seminary and and to the present, um, and also goes back uh, to Darby and the Brethren. And um, that's there's so much more. Uh, one of Corey's uh, volumes chapters is on mid acts dispensationalism, mm-hmm. which is a tradition I think I spend like two sentences mentioning, and then moving mm-hmm. on to to other things because it didn't sort of fit into the the narrative um, I was most interested in. Um, and I also talk about progressive dispensationalism for basically one section of one chapter at, at the end. And uh, as far as I understand, that's a that's a quite popular position these days um, it, within the broader theological conversation. Uh, and so um, so that's one thing I've recognized is, is there's a lot of different ways that dispensationalism can be defined. Um, and particularly when you start getting into the nuances of the different schools, um, there's there's some some disagreements there as well. And I'll mention one of them as I talk about my my particular uh, definition of dispensationalism. Um, I really was struggling with this when I was writing the book. I knew it sort of like, you know, I knew what it was when I saw it, but I was like, uh, what? how am I going to describe this um, in a way that is satisfying to historians uh, in my guild in particular? And so I ended up in the introduction listing a number of features of the system of dispensationalism. I really think the system word is important for talking about what I want, what I wanted to talk about. And it distinguishes what I think a lot of uh, Corey's volume is doing, this dispensational thought. I really take a lot of, I invest a lot in that distinction between dispensational thought and dispensationalism uh, as a system of theology. And I I don't want to cut off or be too chummy, but I would hope it's almost uncontroversial sometime in the future that there is a long tradition of dispensational thought. Um, I, I don't. I, I see almost no um, controversy there. I'm no. I'm sure there's plenty of other people who do, um, but I'm willing. I uh, a, a number of the chapters in the volume were obviously new to me, but I've heard a lot of. They're not the first people to make these connections to a much longer line of particular different aspects of dispensationalism as a system that precede Darby in particular, precede the 1830s or 1840s. So, um, so I, I was already, and I, I, Corey and I have emailed about this. I, I wish I would have used more nuanced language when talking about exactly what Darby was bringing to the table. I still think Darby is quite an important figure. Um, I actually think he's less important than um, other historians do. I actually think people after him are more important, which doesn't win me any dispensationalist friends, but, um, but is, but is where I, I land on that. Um, but, uh, but one thing I don't think Darby did is just sort of create from whole cloth new teachings. Um, That that would be a lot to put on a single person 1800 years into a tradition to come up with something that is so novel. What I do think his novelty is, is in combining things in a different way that we don't see before. Um, And and then in in communicating it in a way that actually resonated with a broad group of people. I think you can find all types of ideas throughout church history that are fringe or considered heresies or other things that are frankly not that notable and are not things I really want to spend a ton of time uh, thinking about. Um, I think there are other developments um, and there are other tapping into longer traditions, which I would say is is one thing Darby was doing that are uh, very notable and interesting. And so what I do is I, I try to list some of the component parts of the system of dispensationalism. I talk about, I do try to root it though it comes later in the list in a certain way of reading the Bible. Um, I, I'm not so um, ready to define exactly uh, what that is because I see change over time on that. I think th- there's uh, one thing, Corey, I'd love if we can remember it after uh, my monologue here is I'd love to hear just how you think about typology. That's one thing I traced throughout my book is the way that um, earlier, uh, I don't even want to call them dispensationalists yet because that term wasn't around, but earlier people within this tradition uh, were, hi- were very typological in how they read the Bible. Now, they, they might have read prophecy um, uh, literally or, or sort of as happening in material space and time uh, corresponding to that, but they, they were also very typological. And I, I gather that's something that a, a sort of consistent historical grammatical method at least tries to control uh, more than mm-hmm. maybe some of the examples uh, that I had. But th- there's definitely a herb. Th- th- I don't, I, I tried not to say it was a hermeneutic either. I was looking and I think I I, I didn't make that faux pas, but maybe I, I did. There is definitely a hermeneutical component to dispensationalism. There's obviously an end times um, theory or, or set of events that are very distinctly dispensationalist. Um, there's the dispensations themselves, this uh, understanding of time. I would even go as far as say there's a philosophy of time 
that is part of the dispensationalist uh, system. Um, there's this church Israel distinction, which again uh, has changed over time um, in terms, at least within the different traditions about sort of how stark that distinction is and what exactly the implications or consequences of that distinction are. But that has also uh, been a very distinctive feature. Um, and then I do get into um, some soteriology in a very little way. I totally agree with Corey that um, one of the things that I did not see in, in my research was a consistent sort of dual um, salvation um, uh, mode. I, I, I definitely saw that critique pop up a lot um, over time. And I even, th th there are things that Schofield said, I, I know there's one footnote in particular in the original Schofield Bible that was, uh, shall we say, not clear and was clarified mm -hmm. by later people that um, that really, and it was clarified because that was not what dispensationalists wanted to be known for. I mean, it, it was clarified because it was, it was, it was mis, uh, misdirecting people um, who were reading it. So um, that being said, as a historian, I did want to track, and this is where that narrowness of the tradition I was following maybe comes in. I wanted to track a particular debate that I saw come in and out throughout the last 150 years, which was this debate about uh, grace, free grace, um, what in the 1980s and 90s was called the Lordship Salvation Controversy. And what was interesting to me is that this debate was emerging in different forms all the way back into the 19th century. And I don't want to say that dispensationalism necessarily lands on one or another position on free grace. I do want to say that the people who have promoted free grace the most consistently and have been most well known for doing it have been dispensationalists and particularly have been through the Dallas Seminary uh, tree. And, uh, and I go into that in the book. But uh, that to me was an important part. One, because it rounded out this conversation to not be uh, this definition to not be just about eschatology, which for non- theologians, the non uh, people who aren't specialists in this think that's what dispensationalism is. It's just a eschatology. It's just the rapture and then the Antichrist. And that's really all you get. There's a reason that's why I try to explain in the book. There's a reason why that is why most what most people think of. Um, but that is not the totality of dispensationalism. So I did want to nod to this interesting subplot or sub story around free grace that um, I uh, I, particularly for my historian friends, I thought was an interesting way to show that there's more at stake here, at least at different po moments in time, than just debating about uh, the end times. Mm. Um, so in, in terms of the theology, that's how I define dispensationalism. Because I'm the historian I am, as Corey said, I'm a social, cultural, intellectual historian. I also think it's really hard to talk about dispensationalism without talking about the people who are dispensationalists. And so I, I go into a sociological definition or definition that's about demographics. Where do we find dispensationalists in American history? Who makes up dispensationalists? Where have they tended to go in other parts of their uh, beliefs, whether that's uh, cultural beliefs or even political beliefs? That's not the main point of my story at all, but I do touch touch uh, at that on various points. So I feel it's incomplete to talk about a definition without the real people who actually teach and promote um, this particular uh, way of, of believing. Um, but I also know that that's sort of the historian's mode and not necessarily a pure theological uh, mode in, in defining it as well. Okay. No, very helpful. Corey, any uh, response or clarifications? Yeah, this is, I'm already enjoying this podcast, this, this episode more than I thought I would. This is fantastic. We can, we can speak about this for a week straight, or at least I can, uh, before I can probably get bored and drop out. Um, I appreciate so much of what Dan just said. Um, and, and this is what's interesting about this conversation. You have two, you have, you have two authors, you have two scholars that are approaching the topic from two different angles. Um, I would, as, as, as a biblical theologian, uh, I do not, and this is just, this is, this is my take. I don't think it is that helpful to critique a system of theology culturally, as Dan said, by their thinkers, the people themselves. I, and this is me, I look at a system of theology as a pattern of beliefs. I think the best way to analyze any theological system or any theology is by what are the what are the beliefs that make it so? Whether we're talking about evangelicalism, what makes someone an evangelical? By uh, by even uh, what makes someone an evangelical? By certain beliefs, and I'll say a high view of scripture, inerrancy, um, the the divinity of Christ, these types of classic fundamentalist beliefs, biblical fundamentalism. I I think it's interesting to do a history of a movement by its people. I mean, you, they kind of, they obviously they overlap. You can't have ideas without the person behind it. 
but it's the ideas that shape the theology. If we're going to do a cultural um, history of theological movements, then there can be tomes written on the influence that, say, post-millennialism has had or covenant theology has had in the, in the realms of, I'm not broad sw sweeping everybody as this, but the dangers of, say, supersessionist beliefs, where that traced from and who were the people that held to it, or even to modern day white nationalism being traced to kinism, being brought back to Christian reconstruction, back to covenant theology. At the root level, I think it's most helpful to deal with the beliefs themselves, which is what our book does, is to show the doctrinal development as opposed to how it was received. Because you can go to any theological movement and look at the fringe voices and how it was received the wrong way. Dan brought up, and I appreciate, there is, a, for example, a footnote in uh, the original Schofield Bible, I believe it's in John one seventeen around there, that was very loose language. And it, it Schofield... Uh, to give him the benefit of the doubt, what he has written elsewhere, certainly did not mean to suggest that there are multiple ways of salvation. That is, in the dispensation of law, people were saved by law, and now we have grace. It was admittedly very loose language, and it caused confusion. And now ever since then, we're, what, 120 years removed from that, however long it's been, people, critics of dispensationalism, still appeal to that as if that's what we teach totally ignorant of the development of dispensational thought and the scholarship that has progressed since the Schofield, that original scope of the reference Bible and how often it's been clarified that particular note. Um, so I appreciate Dan, Dan even bringing that up. Um, but there's, yeah, there's a lot here. So as he said, there's nothing that shouldn't be anything controversial that no one has argued dispensationalism is as old as the New Testament, just like covenant theology is not, or Arminianism or Calvinism or Methodism. Any of these traditions we're not going to say is that's what was originally there. What we're going to say is the beliefs that would make up those systems perhaps were. And that's what we argue in our book. We're going to say the some parts that make up the whole are historically demonstrable, which I think we do a pretty good job by enlisting different scholars who are experts in those eras. So, for example, I didn't write the book on my own and neither did my co-editor, James Fazio. We wrote certain chapters and we edited the whole thing. But we were humble enough to say, hey, Although we believe there are dispensational ideas in these eras, we're not entirely sure. So let's 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 enlist historians and theologians who are experts in these particular eras, who have published in these eras, and let them be honest with the evidence. If if there are something that we can today call dispensational, then great, let's let's hear it. And if there's not, let's hear that as well. So we let the experts do their job, and that's what was demonstrated: the parts that make up the system, not the people themselves, but the beliefs are certainly historically demonstrable all the way to the New Testament, starting with the very word dispensation or economia. And with that, I would say dispensationalism, it is not a, I don't think it's a cultural phenomenon any more than any other system is. It is a, it's not even a systematic theology. It could be considered a historical theology. I think at its root level, it's a biblical theology. And uh, the, re the way I would say that I would borrow terms from Andreas Kostenberger and his new and him and Greg Goswell, his their new magnum opus textbook on biblical theology and the criteria they give what makes something a biblical theology. It's got to be inductive. It's historical. It's descriptive. Dispensationalism meets those requirements. Dispensationalism is inductive in that its positions are a result, as I said earlier, of a consistent use of a, the Protestant principle of grammatical historical exegesis. Were there some people that deviate from there? Absolutely. Dan brought up typology where there's a, yeah, Darby was one of them. There was a lot. There's been a lot within dispensationalism that are big on typology, not so much anymore, but prior, absolutely. So there could be some confusion that were they as consistent uh, with that interpretive method. Problem, no, probably not. But the method itself is what dispensationalism is based on, not the person applying it. So it's dispensationalism is inductive and in as positions are the result of this consistent grammatical historical exegesis. And it, because it, it, it endeavors to cling to the Bible's own use of certain terms like Israel. Israel is always Israel. This is the continuity you see when dispensationalism is critiqued as being discontinuous. There's no discontinuity, depending on how we define that term. It's distinctions. Israel remains Israel. The temple remains temple. People remain people. Animals remain a animals. Salvation is always by grace through faith. Going back to Genesis 3 and so on, I would trace to Genesis 15, 6, the, the, problem, uh, the promise given to Abraham that he believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. We've all, we, there's salvation is, there's a consistent plumb line. Um, kingdom is always kingdom. Covenant 
that is loose language today. Uh, oftentimes today by certain theologians taken very loosely. We're very specific. What covenant are you talking about? Biblical covenants. So they remain covenants. Even this very nomenclature, as I mentioned, or economia. That's the Greek word that the King James translated dispensation. Uh, it's where we get our English word economy. Right. It's it's the system is based on that. You see the word in Ephesians 1 11 and Ephesians 3 2, Colossians 1 25. So it's inductive in that sense. And it's historical and descriptive that is dispensationalism as a system, as opposed to ahistorical uh, systems or prescriptive systems. Right. Because it emphasizes historical context to discover the scripture's meaning. And it's not driven by philosophical categories or cultural trends, which is what Dan's book really hones in on. It's not driven by that. If it's a biblical theology, it's historical, it's descriptive. It provides, as Dan said, he's right, a view of history. There's no doubt about it. We would hold to some who would even define dispensationalism as a certain understanding of biblical history, a philosophy of history, because what it's showing is that history is going somewhere. It's not cyclical. It's not subsumed. That is human history, not subsumed under a theoret theoretical covenant. That happened in eternity past or, or even in the garden or something like that. It's showing that there's a plumb line as God revealed himself more and more that history is going somewhere, which is going to be that end cap of human history. We call the millennial kingdom or the messianic kingdom. If, if history had a beginning time in the creation, then it's going to have an end time at the end of that thousand year reign before we get into that eternal state. And it's tied by God's glory connecting the entire canon. So it's going somewhere. It's linear. It's not cyclical. Um, and of course, dispensationalism is based on this consistent pattern of beliefs. As I said earlier, it's not a social group. And that's where maybe our book really differs a lot from Dan's. He's looking at it as a cultural phenomenon, as, as a social identity. No one can look at someone and say, oh, he's, you know, brown hair, blue eyes. He must be a dispensationalist or something like that. You know, they don't have a certain right. look. It, it should be based on a pattern of beliefs. Um, okay. So those are just some some thoughts. Yeah. No, su super helpful. Okay. So I'm I'm, I'm thinking... You're you're swimming in the waters of typology there. I'm wanting to get back to to that question of Dan's to you, Corey. So Dan, first of all, let me let me do it this way. Any any thoughts on what Corey just laid down, and then can you kind of walk him into? Because I, I think this might be helpful is to think in terms of typology. Like I said, Corey, you're swimming in the lake, but like if we can just focus in on that just a little bit more. But Dan, any response to that? I'd like to jump out of that lake if I can. <laughs> <laughs> typology is not my my expertise, but let's go. Let's, okay. let's well, maybe even maybe it. just in introductory terms, would that be fair enough just to give our give sure, folks of course. a bit of an introductory take on it? Yeah, well, and I'm sure that's as deep as I'll go. I want to go on it either. Um, but uh, well, so much to respond to, Corey. Um, I think the thing I I'd love to hit on, and then I will loop back to to typology. Um, is is your point about um, not wanting to think of dispensationalism as a social phenomenon? I would even say as a historical phenomenon, like in time and place, with everything else that 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 would um, maybe uh, maybe entail. And I want to sort of dig in. Well, one, I want to say, I think I I'm the type of person I want to have both types of inquiries. One, which is, is this true in a trans historical, universal, all times, all places? And how has this true thing or not true thing been actually employed, invoked, um, shaped how humans have lived and and organized themselves? And I actually, here at Upper House, I share an office with a philosopher, a, a PhD in philosophy. We have these arguments all the time. And so, you know, a, a really typical one is, um, you know, uh, Hegel, big philosopher, uh, my my colleague really wants to go to sort of like, was Hegel right on X or Y? And mostly my colleague says, no, he's not a Hegelian at all. He doesn't like Hegel at all. And I always want to go to, isn't it interesting that Hegel was writing with a certain motive in mind, which was about the construction of a German people. And so his, his sort of um, his sense of uh, spirit what had to do with the sort of spirit of the German people. Right off the bat, my colleague is like, why are you talking about this stuff? This is utterly pointless to the question, is this true or not? And this, I think, is a deeper difference between at least some historians and philosophers and theologians, is I have a hard time getting at that question without understanding who are we talking about and when were they um, sort of uh, working and writing. And and yet theologians and well, philosophers, at least, um, think that every, anything that's not sort of directly addressing the, the truth, the pattern of belief, as you call it, is somehow uh, a distraction 
it could be even ad hominem. Like, why are we even talking about this person as a person? So I think there's a, a sort of just methodological difference that I want to acknowledge and say, I hope we can, I, I mean, we are right now, we're talking uh, about it, but I hope there's room for those, both of those types of inquiries. Um, and I'll even, I'll even sort of uh, press further on that. And I, I, I do not mean this to be more provocative than it is. It's a true story. Um, but when I was in Israel, I, I, had a, I had a fellowship in Israel. I met someone from Moody Bible Institute who was also there doing missions work. And I, I have, as we've talked about, I've never been in a Christian college setting before. I, I'm fascinated by them. I've never been them myself. So I asked him, what was it like at Moody? One of the anecdotes he had, I don't think it was the first one, but he said that at the cafeteria, at least this was his experience, people divided in the cafeteria by theology. So there was a table where the mm -hmm. Calvinists hung out. And then there was a table where the Arminians hang, hung out. And as someone who came from a public university, it blew my mind. I was like, how could how could young people, I mean, it, it, are we in the 16th century or you know what? But um, he, he said it very matter of factly, that had been his only college experience. And he's just like, oh yeah, isn't that how people, you know, sort of affiliate with each other? And so what was interesting to me is at that point, I had already been a PhD student. And um, I mentioned I was studying the neoconservatives. That was sort of my first topic. Well, most of the people who became neoconservatives were communists in the 1930s. Um, they were American communists. And I remember this story about at the college, uh, col the City College of New York, they did this exact same thing. There were Trotskyites in one table and there were Stalinists in the other table. And if you know about the history of communism, these people hated each other. Um, they had very different views on the revolution in Russia, on what should happen in response to Nazism. And they basically divided over, you know, tables at college over these things. And the, the insight there was that, ah, religion or particularly my particular brand, evangelicalism, is not much different from almost any other ideology, political system out there. I happen to believe mine is true. Um, at least one, you know, my version of it or the, the tradition I follow is true. Um, but in, in a sort of functional way, we can think of dispensationalism, we can think of fundamentalism, I make this comparison in my introduction, to communism. And I think too many scholars, even within the non-Christian world, have treated religion as something separate, something where like rational thought doesn't actually happen, or where institutions don't matter, or, uh, or other things that sort of dehistoricize, or make it as if something else is happening than is happening. And so that's one of the ways that my methodology, my background, has brought me to um, the way I talk about dispensationalism is I'm actually pulling from really good histories that are have nothing to do with dispensationalism, nothing to do with fundamentalism or theology even, to try to understand how does this system of theology, and maybe this is the big difference in the questioning, is I'm interested in how it gained prominence within certain circles, and then how versions of it spread among the American church and created a situation that I grew up in where there were uh, big segments of the American church that were um, functionally dispensationalist, if not actually, there was just an assumed dispensational uh, framework to how we thought about the world, thought about Israel, thought about everything else. That to me was the question I wanted to answer. And that is sort of beside the point of the truthfulness of it. I mean, that, that's an important question that we should also ask, but that's not the point of the study. The point of the study is not to render a verdict on the truthfulness, it's to render a verdict on why did it happen uh, the way that it did. So anyway, that's that's just a little into uh, that, that's that's how I approach the world. I'm a historian through and through. I get grief from all my friends and family about this, and you can imagine I'm just a delight uh, at at all parties uh, to <laughs> historicize everything. But that's how I that's how I see the world. So um, to jump into typology, I think for me the most simple. Wait, thing wait, wait, before we get into yeah, typology, can I can I respond to a few things that Dan said? Please. Very helpful, and uh, and maybe I'll say these comments maybe reserve them for later what I appreciated the most about your book, um, taking it from a cultural historical phenomenon uh, the last 150 years, how it's been received. Uh, I think there is a place for that. To go back on your 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 specific focus of study being uh, intellectual cultural um, analysis, there is certainly a place for that. I would never say that there's not. My point earlier was that can be done with any theological system, any type of any type of patterns of belief. You can look at the, the people behind them and, and then also how it's been received throughout history. Here's my problem, if there is a problem. This is just, it's not even a problem. It's more of a caution for those who are historians tackling a massive theological, you know, system is that oftentimes what gets what gets emphasized are the questionable thinkers, the fringe people, 
um, the ones that the scholars themselves uh, who are firsthand representative of that system would, would want to keep at arm's length too and go, that's not what the system believes. They're just a bad, weak representative of it. And we can go to any system for representatives of that. With a with a historical tracing or a, histor- a modern history of dispensationalism, like, like Dr. Hummel's book is, um, it's going to inevitably leave out a big chunk of people, which, you know, he just said, I mean, that's just inevitable, right? Of voices that were that weren't even included in the discussion. It's interesting he brought up fundamentalism and, and dispensationalism. Well, there's an excellent, wonderful history book that was published just recently, two years ago, by New York uh, University Press by Daniel Bear, Black Fundamentalists right. in the Era of Segregation. And he gives voice to this marginalized group who were fundamentalists, even dispensational, that don't show up in Dan Hummel's book at all. If there, if it does, I think there might have been a passing footnote or a reference. I can't remember. Maybe you do, Dan. You can correct me on that. But here's a whole history of people that would that seems to suggest otherwise. That one dispensationalism and fundamentalism in this era of segregation and racism uh, were not all white. There were very prominent black theologians who would call themselves fundamentalists and even premillennial and even dispensational. It was more of a northern interpretation. Um, of what's going on in the South um, that 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 we kind of by and large taken for granted their understanding, but in the South they were very prominent. They had their own newspapers, their own periodicals. There were even there were even white dispensationalists who were founding schools with black leadership for them to run as well. Because historically, at the time, obviously, uh, with the racism that was so pervasive at the time and segregation, whites did have more of a prominent stage. But they were using that stage to be able to, in so many different ways, establish black schools and colleges and seminaries to be run by blacks. This is a whole movement of people historically that weren't included in, say, uh, Dan's book, which may have overturned some of his positions if if they were included. And I say that just as um, um, to agree with Dan that a historical uh, historical cultural phenomenal study of the phenomenon of a movement is certainly valuable. There's no, I learned a lot about actually modern history of dispensationalism reading Dan's book. Um, so it was very helpful, but there's also a lot that's left out when you, when you, when you tackle a system of theology doctrinally and how those beliefs developed as we do in discovering dispensationalism, then you're going to get more of a neutral understanding of what the philosophy, the theology, the framework actually teaches without being distracted by some of the fringe or questionable proponents of that system. Yeah, that's great. And and just to respond to that, um, I don't um, go very deeply into African American uh, dispensationalism. I do talk about it in a couple pages, um, really trying to explain why there isn't a larger um, uh, dispensationalist following, given other affinities between white and black uh, conservative Protestants. But you're right, there, there's more that could be done there. I I have a cutting room floor that is very long um, on that stuff. Um, and I also want to just highlight people like Arthur Pearson, who was a really important uh, turn of the century white uh, leader, di- proto-dispensationalist, someone who um, held the most of the views that was very progressive on progressive for the time at least on on racial equality and and wrote about it actually i i mentioned he he published wb du bois in his journal um the the missionary journal that he ran which um, i mean du bois is sort of the radical or one of the radical voices so it, it tells you something about pearson's own sort of curiosities and and ecumenism on that front so um yes you're right and and the way you tell these histories um really does shape the conclusions you make and um, and, and I don't want to shy away from that. So I made certain decisions that were to tell this particular story. I was interested in sort of the broadest possible influence and to be able to explain why, um, uh, why we get to a point where, you know, books that are popularized versions of dispensationalism are selling tens of millions of copies. I didn't think that story had been told properly, um, yet. I also didn't, um, I, I hope I didn't overemphasize the fringe people. I mean, people that I found, I was trying to find just the most influential people. That was my, my main, um, my main objective, but um, people like, I don't, Darby's not fringe to me. I think he's a really fascinating figure. I think the people that come in his wake are as well. The Moody movement has a lot of interesting figures, very important. Um, And then all the way up to the present, um, you know, people like Hal Lindsey and Tim LaHaye, who people have different views on, certainly on both of those figures and how um, I, and how, uh, how digestible um, their versions are. I would never call either of them fringe. Boy, they are, uh, quite uh, central to uh, many networks of evangelicals in their era. So, 
Um, I think you're right. I mean, one one thing that I was I saw a footnote in your book on, and I I think I dismissed in just a a, a, a flippant comment even because I didn't really want to get into it. Was this sort of canard that Darby ripped off the rapture from a Scottish girl named Margaret mm -hmm. McDonald? This was right. sort of a, a just a a, a falsification of um, mm -hmm. a, of of a historical record. Um, so, you know, th that would maybe be, you know, playing to the fringe, uh, if you really uh, centered mm -hmm. that story. Actually, I just read, I won't say the book, but I just read a book that was published this year, um, that, that, that mentions that it would sort of unproblematically that, that just roots the rapture mm -hmm. in this, in this sort of uh, mm -hmm. story. Um, and then the other thing that I, I was, um, uh, I was trying to do, and by the way, I'm not looking Corey for you to, uh, agree with me on, and like, uh, meet me halfway. I'm just saying sort of how I was thinking through these things, you know, sure. another sort of fringe, um, part that people emphasize on dispensationalism is the date setting. And that was a hard one for me because I understand the system should not have any date setting. There, there's no room for that. In fact, it's sort of it's premised on there not being a fixed date. And that's one thing that distinguishes the tradition that Darby really advances from the existing premillennial, what we call historicist uh, premillennialism, which was about date setting. It was about reading Revelation historically and trying to understand how these symbols lined up to particular events in the recent past, including things like the French Revolution and and Napoleon and other things. And Darby was against that. That was one of the key things he said, you know, this is, and everyone after him was against that as well. That being said, there is a tradition um, of people who come out of the dispensationalist tradition um, of setting dates. And, and some of them are more uh, certain, others want to group it into a certain decade or something like that. And I wanted to acknowledge that because I'm thinking of other people who aren't in the dispensationalist camp who'd say, how could you sort of whitewash a history of dispensationalism and not mention these very prominent people who got a lot of attention? But I also did not want to make them the center uh, of the story or even, uh, I mean, I, I start one chapter with Edgar Wisenhunt, who's this guy who, um, 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Happen in 1988. Mm -hmm. And I start with him because a lot of people recognize that, particularly of a certain age. But the whole point of that anecdote was to say he had almost nothing to do with any scholarly institution that at the time was dispensationalist. To me, that's interesting. I, I don't want to just say, well, he was wrong, so I don't want to talk about him. It's why did this guy get such attention when he had almost uh, almost no credential? He had no credentials to be talking about these things. Um, and his book is uh, really hard to read. It's, it's very weird and it has no, no scholastic merit at all. Um, and yet this person for a few years sort of represents dispensationalism to a lot of Americans. I found that to be an interesting question, regardless of the truth or falsity. But I also made sure I didn't want to center people like that as the sort of purveyors of the history um, of dispensationalism. Josh, I see your hand. Yeah, I've got my, I've got my finger raised. Thanks, Dan. No, no, because you're bringing up Darby and we've got to get there. So I know we we'd floated the idea of typology. We've got to get into Darby a little bit. Um, Corey and I were talking um, during the aforementioned long wait. Uh, before the episode, we were <laughs> no, we were talking about uh there there was a Jets article um and and of course Corey was familiar with it um you might be as well it was from a few years back and it talked about um Darby at least as the proponent or the uh, founder of a system of dispensationalism so at least dispensationalism sort of system and specifically they spoke of it as a reaction to post millennial thought um there uh, in in Northern Ireland at Trinity College but um I think it's Corey I think it's your turn to lead off but let's get into Darby a little bit a little bit of an introduction uh, what what role does he play did he invent this system did he invent the the theology was he an innovator where, where does John Nelson Darby fit into this conversation well, there's no doubt that he is a pivotal character within this whole story. Um, to suggest otherwise would be just historically irresponsible. In fact, we devote a whole chapter in our book, and we call it the Darby era. We have pre-Darby, and then we have uh, what's after Darby, I think, which goes into the Reformation era, or excuse me, what goes into modern America. Um, but we have a pre-Darby era leading up to Darby, and there's a Darby era from 1800 to 1882. That's the lifespan of John Nelson Darby. Um, he's certainly a, a, a pivotal character and in that chapter we enlisted max wermchuk who is a known he, he doesn't identify as a dispensationalist um he is a known biographer on Jelson, john nelson darby he publishes in french uh in german um as well as in english i believe he publishes in french he certainly does in german and in english different works on darby and he published the book john nelson darby several years ago published through scs press um so we have him in this particular uh chapter giving us his take on John Nelson Darby. And it's interesting what comes out in this chapter, because what you see with John Nelson Darby, contrary to popular thought, 
that dispensationalism is sourced in there in, in Darby. And, and that's one of the pushbacks I would maybe give Dan in his book is that he's it, it's the common standard error, I would say, whether it was the publisher who says it or 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 Dr. Hummel himself, whatever. But thinking dispensationalism originates with Darby is not correct. Uh, the system formally, perhaps afterwards, and what I appreciate about Dan's book is he makes it very clear is that dispensationalism today is very much removed from uh, John Nelson Darby's thought in multiple ways, which is true. And not too many historians and even theologians recognize it. And Dan does in his book, which was great to read. But Darby basically, here's a thinker. He did not develop his ideas in a vacuum at all, uh, though they would become key ideas for, for Darby's formulations. Uh, that is beliefs concerning world the world uh, history being advanced through divine dispensations or economies, uh, along with a future for national Israel and a translation of the church, we would call a rapture. Um, these ideas were in circulation for centuries before his time. So contrary to popular mischaracterizations, Darby did not come to his understanding of dispensationalism through what I say in the book, you know, cryptic revelation, or nor did he claim some special anointing, which a lot of these guys that Dan just mentioned do when he would said that the, they represent dispensationalism to me, they do not at all, which is why I'm focused on the beliefs, not the person, because there's a lot of people out there that wouldn't, if you were to go to all their other beliefs, how they connect, you would see those aren't dispens. He's not holding to the distinctions of dispensationalism, a literal hermeneutic consistently, a future for national Israel, um, whatever may be the ultimate purpose of history to God's glory, all these different things, different divine dispensations, how they're, they progress throughout history. You're going to see some holes in those people that are date setting. As Dan said, dispensationalists of all people should be the least. There shouldn't be any date setters associated with dispensationalism because we believe in an imminent pre-tribulational rapture, at least traditional dispensationalists do. There's no warning of it. It's going to happen without warning. Um, but uh, uh, that aside for a second. Uh, Darby didn't come to his understanding of dispensationalism through the through this type of cryptic revelation or special anointing. Um, his iteration, rather, of dispensational thought was not particularly novel for his day. And that's what we make clear in the book. Um, like an anticipation of the Lord's imminent return reaches all the way back to the early church. A lot of people don't know that. We, we show the patristics and what they thought in this and that. And I've seen era theologians. Dan brought up Paul Boyer. And his book, When Time Shall Be No More, and there are some critiques to give to it, as, as he does, because he kind of lumps all premillennialism together. But there are some good parts of that book as well. Oh, yeah. It was published by Harvard University Press in 1992. He's this. I'm just going to quote it, because I do have this particular quote on there, uh, that I have on my screen. This is Paul Boyer. And do with it what you will. He says, quote, Darby's system contained nothing new. His focus on the future fulfillment of prophecy, followed by the eschatology of the early Christ uh followed the eschatology of the early Christians. Premillennialism had been an option for Protestant evangelicals since Joseph Mead's day, while rudimentary forms of dispensationalism go back at least as far as uh, Jehoiakim of Fior, which would be in the medieval times, and I would say even before then. See, what Darby did contribute, this is me now, what Darby did contribute through his voluminous writings, and Josh, you and I were talking about this beforehand, Darby kind of vomited every thought he had on paper. So you got to know what part of Darby's life are you analyzing? He's some of the hardest reading to to, <laughs> to read through. Uh, it's a lot of slugging through. He's got long, concatenated sentences, parenthetical remarks within parenthetical remarks that go on and on and on. It's hard. Are you analyzing Darby in his earlier years? You know, from his from, from his mid twenties or early thirties, from his midlife to his and what part of Darby? Because he wrote so much. But what he did contribute through all these writings, what I think, to dispensationalism was direction along with organization for what would in time generate modern forms of dispensationalism. Mm. Okay, So through his inductive study of the scriptures in their original languages, Darby was brilliant. Um, most people, not, not a lot of people know this. He won the Classics Gold Medal in Trinity College, which was uh, Latin, Hebrew, and Greek. He translated the English Bible with a team around him, but he was certainly the lead uh, translator into from the Greek and Hebrew into German, into French, into English. It's still one of the best English translations. Uh, even into Dutch, his involvement in the Dutch language, we're not entirely sure, but he had some involvement in that. He preached in local tribal languages. He learned the language and was able to preach and evangelize through them. So he was this brilliant linguist, if you will. That's something what he what he contributed. There was inductive study of the original languages of scripture, um, not end times. That's what later grabbed a hold in American dispensational thought. And Dan actually brings that up quite well. Darby was more focused if there was a theological systematic doctrine, it was his doctrine of the church, ecclesiology. That would later drive his eschatology. 
but it was his doctrine of the church, I think, not in times that would leave probably the most indelible mark for later dispensationalists to advance. And of course, when he comes over seven or eight times in North America, the prophecy conferences, American audiences really took hold of his eschatology. And now you have today this this mischaracterization that dispensationalism, if it's not about teaching multiple ways of salvation, then it's all about eschatology. You know, both are, are incorrect. Um, Darby himself was very his thought process was, was very much focused on the church and um, an organic fellowship, not having a clergy laity divide. He took Martin Luther's advances in the Reformation and just advanced them further to that priesthood of all believers, uh, which is why even though he stayed in Anglican his whole life, interestingly enough. He influenced today what we would have in America. And that probably comes out in that Gribben and Sweetenham article, uh, Joshua brought up. I think it's in there. But modern day independent churches, non-denominational churches, um, independent Bible schools and seminaries, we can trace that all the way to Darby. So he affected Christian education as well just by not being a proponent of denominations because he saw them all as corrupt or ruined, as he said, the ruin of the church. Um, so there's 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 a little bit about Darby. I'm not an expert on Darby. Thankfully, Max Warenchuk, who writes the, the chapter in our book, is, as well as my co-editor, uh, James Fazio. His dissertation was defended under Crawford Gribben. It's on the ecclesiology of John, uh, ecclesiology of John Nelson Darby. So these are they're more experts in Darby himself. Uh, but that's sort of a broad overview uh, I would give of Darby. Yeah, no, that was that was fascinating, Corey. Um, Dan, your thoughts on that? Is that is that what you found or any uh, yeah, any comments on on what you've been presented there and your take on him? Yeah, I resonate. I I agree with you know ninety something percent. I'll never say a hundred, Corey. There's there's something in there, but um, uh, yeah, as I, you I, should I, not. <laughs> um, I agree with a lot of that. I think what I would add to it is, um, and maybe this will make Corey disagree with me more. Um, so uh, our our irenicism might be short lived, but I think um, uh, I think what I would do. So I, one way I was thinking about this, I was reflecting on our two books and. One thing you're trying to do, Corey, I think, is really de-emphasize Darby as a pivotal figure in the long history of dispensational thought. I think I'm in some ways trying to do the same thing, but sort of from the reverse side, which is to say he doesn't even matter that much after he's around. Um, I, or I want to diminish how much, and this is where you got to sort of what we call dispensationalism today does not look a lot like what Darby actually taught. And it starts with this ecclesiology or this, this, I mean, I, as I root it, and I'm not the, I didn't come up with this interpretation, but that Darby's biggest gripe in the 1820s when he was a cleric uh, for the Anglican church was around the church and around the compromised nature of the church to worldly powers like the British empire. And he was in Ireland and there was a certain way that played out in Ireland, but this was his sort of originating insight into um, breaking with a lot of what um, he had sort of, um, at least a lot of the culture around him to develop a distinctive theology. Um, so he carries with him a, I mean, he's he's the founder of the Brethren Movement, and he ends up leading the Exclusive Brethren Movement after the split in 1848. And um, and he, he has views that very few Americans that aren't Brethren pick up, including no clergy. Most of the people who pick up Darby and actually are teaching some part of what he taught were, were clergy. James Brooks, uh, Cyrus Schofield, Lewis Schaefer, all, all them, uh, well, was Schaefer, I'm not sure if Schaefer was a, a pastor or not, but certainly Brooks and Schofield mm -hmm. were at, at various times in their life. So they believed in the clergy class. They believed in a clergy lay um, divide. Um, and Darby also didn't believe in denominations. Most of these people, as um, uh, Thomas Ice's uh, uh, chapter talks about, were Presbyterian um, or Baptist. Mm -hmm. And people even earlier than James Brooks, people like James Inglis, uh, were affiliated with different denominations. So already at the start, there's um, a departure from Darby among the American recipients to his views. I think this is really important, maybe for different reasons than Corey does. But one of the things that's interesting to me is how the reality of Darby not being the sort of direct source that a lot of people who later follow parts of his um, insights do, what, what the effect of that is. And so I look at the origination of the prophecy chart. I mean, this didn't come out of no, like, you know, someone made up the way to, to depict um, at least this part of the teachings of Darby visually to help people understand, because it was a, for many people, is a new way of thinking about the end times. Well, if you have a chart a chart does certain things and simplifies other things or even erases other things. So while a chart and particularly prophecy charts have a horizontal 
orientation to them. You're looking at time sort of progressing from left to right on a, on a piece of paper. What is not often depicted in those early prophecy charts is the church Israel distinction. It, you'd have to see it through sort of the divisions of time, but you're not seeing a sort of the way Darby often talked about it, a sort of heavenly and earthly people. Um, and so the, the very popularization of Darby's teachings in these particular ways meant that the people who were receiving them, because they weren't going back to the original source, they didn't want to work through Darby's writings either. Um, they were inter They were sort of receiving partial chunks of different teachings and then having to fit them in with other things that they believed about the church, about uh, everything else um, in the Christian faith. And there's where you get this really interesting but messy story of how Darby's thoughts actually sort of enter America and then are changed. This is why I think people are so important because you can't even, I don't even know how you would tell the story. It's not like a rational development, at least how I read it, from Darby to Brooks to, I mean, there's a way you could tell that, but there's another way where there's a lot of other factors happening that are causing people to be interested in these ideas in the first place. Another thing, Darby was uh, not a good writer. He also hated revivalism. Uh, he thought it was bad on a sort of um, theological level. He thought it produced what he called shallow Christians. Um, he also uh, just didn't like to meet in big numbers. He liked to meet people one-on-one-on-one -on -one -on -one and thought that by meeting with clergy, he could then convert a bunch of clergy to leave their denominations. And then that's how sort of his teachings would spread. Well, it turns out they were spread almost the opposite way, which is people like Dwight Moody and many people other uh, beyond them, Ruben Torrey, many others, um, basically in, in adopted big chunks of Darby's teachings and taught them through revival, through popularization. Darby would have hated this, I think. Um, I, I don't want to speak for him, but what he said in his time was that he did not like this stuff. He he met Moody a couple times, Dwight Moody, and he was not impressed. Um, he, he didn't find Moody to be theologically sophisticated at all. So I find this to be, I mean, there's, there's a way it can be a sort of a cheap irony. There's an ironic part of this that the very thing that Darby didn't you know, want to have happen actually had happened. But I also just find it fascinating that this is how theological ideas spread in the United States. Um, it's not just dispensationalism. I think that's something um, Corey mentioned before. I wish we did this with all theological systems. I don't want to se select dispensations. We should do this with covenantalism, with Puritanism, with Pentecostalism. This is how we should understand all of it, I think. Um, but this is, in my reading, this is how ideas spread. And so I really actually want to diminish uh, any sense that we have a straight line from Darby to uh, John Walvoord or something like that. There, there's no straight line. There are people who pick up ideas and try to be faithful to where they found them, but also try to integrate them into what they're doing in their lifetime. And you have a chain of transmission that goes from Darby. This is one of the reasons I think Darby's important because it's hard to find trains of transmission that are clear before Darby to all these Americans. There's a pretty clear chain after him um, that go from Darby to other brethren, to James Brooks, to Schofield, to Schaefer, and then we're off to the races and there's a whole sort of web there's a web even before that, but that's a that's one of the clear lines. But that's how I want to think about it. And I just can't um, just to return to one of our methodological differences. To me, this is all about the people. It's about where the when the people lived. It's about what was on their minds. What did they care about? What are the institutions they wanted to build? Why did they want to put this particular theology at the bedrock of what they were trying to build? Um, but really, by I would say by the 1890s. Um, Darby's, I mean, Darby dies in 1882, as Corey said, even by 1882, I don't think Darby's that relevant of a figure for the story of American dispensationalism. I think, um, he, he has a role to play, but really it's, it's passed off to a much broader set of characters after that. Mm -hmm. Now the, uh, the epitaph on, on, on Darby's tomb makes it's perfect sense in this conversation. It literally says unknown and well-known. Right. Taking yeah. Paul's words. That's who Darby becomes this boogeyman, this enigmatic figure, enigmatic figure. You you brought up, Dan, at the beginning of our conversation, uh, Donald Akinson and Akinson, who is no fan of Darby at all. But he does list, Dar list Darby as the fourth most influential person in evangelical history, just after Calvin, Luther and John Wesley. Then comes John Nelson Darby. There's so much that he influenced. So he is certainly certainly a pivotal character. But he's not the sole character. And uh, so what do you do with this guy? That's like court, this enigmatic guy. You know, it's like you have to give him a place in history. And we do in our book. We get we devote a whole chapter to him, as I mentioned. Um, but you can't focus so much on him where he becomes the originator or this evil genius behind the system. He wasn't. And, and I would say this, Dan, I, I one thing that was was missing in, in your book that with what we're talking about, 
how beliefs came to North America and became so prominent from from Darby, say his eschatology or something. It had to be more than just one man in his seven or eight trips to North America. And I think we do a good job. And this is just me because I'm the editor, so I'm going to be partial to it um, in our book. We address that in a way that no other book has on the history of dispensationalism, and that is how do we get from dispensational thought in Europe, say where Darby is and the thinkers there, to modern America? Uh, Larry Pettigrew, who's a uh, professor at Shepherd's Theological Seminary, he's an expert on the American Bible Conference movement, uh, the Niagara Conferences, the, the Seacliff Bible Conferences. That is where you see these ideas now become promulgated on a grand scale in the United States. And that is where guys like C.I. Schofield and Allison, you know, rise up to the scene and are part of some of these conferences. James Hall Brooks would be the most prominent at that time, an American Presbyterian dispensationalist. And by the way, these guys were all Calvinists, too. Um, this is going back to something I was mentioned earlier with the free grace lordship debate. That is such an in-house minuscule debate within dispensationalism, just so you know, from a primary voice. That is an in-house debate, and there are it's equally split. Um, so to give it uh, uh, try to find this indelible link between dispensationalism and free grace to me is a non-starter. It is something that is that is just disagreed across the table, and there are proponents on both sides that claim dispensationalism, but that's an in-house thing. Um, but those beliefs th through American Bible Conference, specifically prophecy, I think that's where, more so than Darby, where those beliefs, uh, specifically eschatology, uh, uh, an inerrant belief in scripture, you see rise up from this movement, uh, a high doctrine of uh, scripture, high view of scripture. We can, we can attribute the American Bible Conference movement to this, who were, of course, almost virtually, not all, but vir almost virtually premillennial and dispensational uh, uh, influenced. Um, from these ideas in Europe with Darby, and then on a grander scale through the through the conference movement and the prophecy conference movement in America in the 1800s. Yeah, I agree with that. With the with the folks on the prophecy conference movement, I I actually brought it out to talk about Bible institutes, mission agencies, and Bible uh, conferences as being mm -hmm. the three sort of parts of a what I call a premillennial complex by the turn of the century of 1900 that are really the bedrock of evangelicalism in america i mean it, it, we talk about dwight moody as this figure we call i i'm not bar i'm borrowing this phase the moody movement i mean so much of what went for evangelicalism in america including things like invoking biblical inerrancy um are are, are somehow linked to moody sort of like the billy graham of his era billy graham has a similar role to play a few generations later but I think that's so important to understand. It's a very complex way that these ideas are received and then spread. Um, I do think this is, um, uh, and maybe we'll get to. I don't know. I don't know how we're going to get to everything, Josh. But maybe we'll get to this. Um, when Josh has I, plumbing problems at his house. He's trying to get to. That's what you're looking at right now. Oh huh? my, my house is going to be knee deep by the time I get home. But that's all right. <laughs> Worth it. When I talk about the rise of dispensationalism. Um, this is sort of what I mean. Uh, this is the part of the story where you just see dispensationalism and the ideas under dispensationalism permeating almost every corner, not every corner. There's always uh, differences of opinion and there's a strong covenantalist uh, tradition as well, but per permeating vast parts of what we call evangelicalism in the early 20th century. So by the time we get to 1950, 1960, uh, this is how I tell the story. It's, it's an open question um, if dispensationalism will be the dominant tradition in evangelicalism. Um, I know that's been a, I don't think all dispensationalists read it that way. That's how I read the rapid institution building, the investment in seminaries, the investment in Bible call and actually turning Bible institutes into Bible colleges and all that other stuff. But I think it's really important to understand that most people who are dispensationalist, uh, or maybe they might, don't even know the term, but they are in a church that teaches that, or they just believe that. Um, probably never heard the name Darby unless it was a, a sort of lobbed as a, you know, a sort of insult or something. Mm -hmm. And probably don't know anything about the brethren. I mean, that, even though that's a one of the gestation bodies for these ideas, the brethren are a very small movement, uh, relatively speaking to American Christianity, um, even though many people out of that have have influence way beyond their reach. And so this is another way of saying, I mean, Darby's a part of the story. He is, I, I, I don't know if I agree with Atkinson exactly on that ranking, but certainly Darby's a top 10 um, Protestant in the, you know, Protestant uh, in Protestant history in terms of influence. Um, but, uh, but we also really need to be clear that, um, that there's a lot of people in between then and now. Uh, 
that um, that mediate that. And this is where I just take another insight from my training. Um, and this, I don't think this book will be uh, referenced again, Josh. Maybe it will be uh, on your call uh, on your podcast. But um, Edward Said's book from the 1970s, Orientalism, um, was a book that critiqued the way Westerners viewed the Orient, and basically that most Westerners saw the Orient as timeless. And particularly one of the things he talked about was Islam and how most Westerners, when they looked at Islam, looked at the teachings of Muhammad and assumed nothing had changed since that time in the 19th century or 20th century. And so could sort of really make some simplistic assumptions about Muslims. I take that same insight. And there's a there's a sociologist many years ago who talked about fundamentalists as the internally orientalized Americans, the ones who most people in the academy look at and assume they never change. They have a really sort of static view of, um, they don't think, they're anti-intellectual. They don't ever even understand that ideas change over time. And of course, I, I grew up in that world. I also just know that that's bad history. And I wanted to actually apply that generosity, that's how I understood it, to dispensationalism, to say everyone between Darby and uh, now is thinking about these things. They're not just sort of mindlessly receiving them from, uh, from Darby. Um, they are thinking through them and then passing them on. And there's inevitable sort of development um, and change and critique and everything else that every human who tries to think through these things does. And so in my own way, I know uh, dispensationalists probably don't feel that, but I was trying to bring some life to the dispensationalist tradition to actually say there's an intellectual history here worth telling and not just that a bunch of people followed the, the teachings of Darby uh, with, and were apocalyptic or something like that, that there's actually thinking going on here. And again, I'm not, I'm not weighing in on whether that's erroneous thinking or truth thinking, but there's the fact that people are struggling with these things and building institutions and investing their entire lives in these certain understandings. That to me was the key thing to bring to the dispensationalist tradition that I saw was missing, even from people like Boyer. Mm. Dan, I'm wondering if you could walk us into that, because that, that is one question. I know we're running out of time, but that's that's one question I definitely wanted to address was that that's sort of part of the tenor of your, uh, if I could say critique or your your assessment of dispensationalism when you when you know that 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 title, that captivating title of the rise and fall. Um, and one of the things you've tried to clarify um, when you've been on our show before is that you're not necessarily critiquing the theology, as you've made clear today, but instead you're looking at institutions, you're looking at uh, scholarly uh, articles, or uh, we could say academic sort of dispensationalism that's that's extant in our, uh, in our world. Um, I know we've talked kind of off air about that, but walk us into that a little bit, and then we'll go over to Corey for that, though. But what's your take on the the state or the presence of academic or scholarly contributions to dispensationalism, institution building within, uh, uh, within dispensationalism, um, and how that's played into your take on it in the book? Yes, and um, I I want to be um, in a posture of learning on, on some of this. I mean, I have my views, and I, I, I think they're relatively well-founded, but I'm always eager to learn more. I've already learned more since the book came out. Um, but, uh, you know, one thing, I went back and read the chapter that I call Collapse, which is the second to last chapter, where I try to trace what I see is in the 80s and 90s, a decline in, a, more than a decline of fall in the influence of uh, scholastic, is what I call it, scholastic dispensationalism. And I, I noted that I hedge a lot, so I don't ever declare it dead or something like that. I say it's nearing or... Um, you know, signs of life are dim, or I, I don't remember all my, um, but I did, I was hedging because I didn't want to declare, I mean, something that's just demonstrably not dead. Um, I didn't want to declare it dead. Um, but I would say the fall, the way I defend the fall uh, trope, um, it is a trope. We, we, the rise and fall is a thing that comes, uh, it comes throughout, uh, you know, all types of literature. The one that I really had in mind was the rise and fall of great powers. Uh, which is a book from the 1980s by Paul Kennedy. And he has a chapter in there on the British Empire. The British Empire was not gone in the 1980s. It was greatly diminished. Um, and that's, that is sort of the mode I was thinking of with uh, scholastic dispensationalism. I just mentioned I have this story of, of by 1960, there's this sense that this is the way I try to capture that the basically the evangelical world is potentially um, going to be uh, influenced deeply by dispensationalism. There's an a article from 1957 I cite by Charles Ryrie in Bibsack, where he um, basically um, notes with a lot of satisfaction that dispensationalists are at the center of all the important conversations in evangelical theology in 1957. So I take that as sort of a high point, and then I, I sort of trace how that 
that project, that project of somehow influencing the broader evangelical world, uh, in my tr in my view, you know, falls apart. And I realize I'm talking to someone who's part of that tradition, and it's awkward to you know sort of declare something <laughs> that the person on the call um, <laughs> sees himself a part of. So I don't want to I don't want to overstate this. And maybe I I I think I've told Corey this. Um, it, maybe I have I didn't... fallen, by the way, but only like in height as I've gotten older, height. shorter for some <laughs> reason. I don't know why. Right. Um, I, I wish that I could have added one more paragraph on page 317, where I do acknowledge that that there are places, including Southern California Seminary, that continue to teach dispensationalism. I wish I could have added one more. Uh, I could have. I didn't. I wish I would have added one more paragraph um, that actually listed some of the names of the people who are doing, continue to do work in a either largely for me a a revised or classical dispensationalist mode i see progressive dispensationalism unlike or like some people unlike some other people as a pretty strong departure from the commitments of the broader tradition but i wish i would have done that because um it would have saved me a number of emails where i have to sort of clarify this um but it also uh would have acknowledged that i don't think um I don't know what the future is. I'm not going to predict it too much. I do think if I if I do do a second edition 20 years from now, and there is a very vibrant scholar scholarly dispensationalist um, uh, community, I will be talking about a revival. Um, I don't think it's going to be oh there was actually no change over time from 1980 to 2050 or, or whatever, um, because I think from that height in 1957 with Ryrie basically saying everything that is important in theology um, sort of has to, dispensations are in the mix. I think the convers I think the state of the field, the state of evangelical thought is way, way different uh, now. Um, I think um, there's, and I go through a lot of these, but there's various movements that have come and gone that have marginalized dispensationalist um, categories or thinking within the broader evangelical church. And um, and there's there's also a just diminished. We I, I trace a few just briefly institutions that sort of reject uh, dispensationalism or move on from it from something else. I go to an evangelical free church here in Madison. The evangelical free church denomination got rid of premillennialism from its doctrinal uh, statement of faith in that in 2019 to a very large majority. Um, I think it was about 75, 25, the vote was. Uh, just another sign that uh, something that was at the core of the founding of the Free Church in 1950 as a denomination had become what they considered a very secondary issue by 2019. So I trace that, and really the fall is relative to the rise or relative to the aspirations, what I see, of particularly the mid-20th century ambitions of the people at Dallas Seminary and Grace Theological Seminary and Talbot seminary. And um, and I'm trying to give sort of an explanation for why that's not the state of affairs anymore. And the last thing I'll say is one of the audiences I had for this book, as I've mentioned, are historians and particularly American religious historians. It was surprising to me, and this is one of the reasons I wanted to write the book, that so many American religious historians assume that there is an equivalency between evangelicals and dispensationalism. And I'm not joking about that. That they assume this is the theology. This is the only game in town. Um, some of them might realize that, like someone, at really, you know, these are people that would would get out of the the, the church world. People like Tim Keller um, aren't dispensationalists, but that would be you'd have to explain that to them. I even think of you know Mark Knoll wrote the foreword to my book. Mark Knoll, you know, famously wrote the scandal of the evangelical mind in 1995, and he blamed a lot of all of the problems of evangelicalism on dispensationalism. The, that was like one of the, and I, and and I, in one way, I agree with him, um, particularly of a popularized version that I think has done a lot of damage in in. But but that's not the scholastics problem. I mean, it is in some ways, but. Corey, I don't think you can control much of that. And I don't think the people at Dallas Seminary can control much of that. And I actually wanted to um, give a story where I can explain why, if you want to indict the evangelical mind today, you actually don't need to indict dispensationalism. That's not part of the conversation anymore. There's other things that are, if you want to do that, are you know uh, influencing evangelicals. But it's not really dispensationalism. And that, to me, was the sort of crux of why I wanted to call it the rise and fall, was because I wanted to be able to explain, particularly people who aren't really, really invested in these uh, conversations, why they shouldn't be looking to dispensational theologians to sort of blame the state of the evangelical mind. That's not that's not where we're at anymore. It might have been in 1957. At least it was up for debate, uh, but it's not anymore. So that's um, that's sort of how I 
wanted to structure uh, the last uh, few chapters of my book is to give that that explanation. But I also want to be, as I mentioned, a posture of learning where, um, you know, one one little piece of detail that I just learned, I didn't just learn it, but I it just sort of hit me, was that the editor of uh, Jets is uh, Dorian Coover Cox, who is at Dallas. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm not looking forward to the uh, Jets review. Uh, I don't think that's going to be a very positive one, but that's okay. Um, but that that is a sign to me, and it's something that I, I finished this book in 2021. I, I know she, that's when she took the editorship, so I'm not sure if I knew it or not at the time. But that to me is a sign of like, oh, it's not as fallen as I thought because the major journal uh, for the major society is being you know edited by uh, what I gather. I assume she's a dispensationalist. Um, so you know, th th there's much yet to be written. I end my preface by saying this is just one more entry into the long, long discourse about dispensationalism in American history. And so I assume there will be much more to be written uh, after this. Hmm. Corey. Yeah, there was so much to respond to. I, I, I appreciate so much of what you said, Dan. Um, you know, whether Dorian Cooper Cox is a dispensationalist herself, I'm not sure. She does, as you said, edit Jets as well as Bib Sack um, with Glenn Kreider at, at, at Dallas. But there's within Dallas, the institution itself, you have it's not the bastion of traditional dispensational thought like it used to be. Um, you have progressives there. You do have a strong representative of traditional dispensationalists still, which unfortunately uh, did get left out, I guess, in the in the in the concluding chapters of your book, because there are guys like Elliot Johnson who are still there, part of the old guard with Charles Ryrie, uh, Paul Weaver's there, Nate Hoff is there. There are some dispensational um, who are even identify as traditional dispensationalists. Um, and so the idea that it's fallen, I caught recently, uh, Dan, your your interview with uh, Al Mohler as well, whereas almost, there was a comment made like you can put all the traditional dispensationalists maybe and fill up one room, if that. Um, I, I'm going to take exception to that. Um, and I think to go back on just the title of, of your book, The Rise and Fall of Dispensationalism, that's totally helpful. That's so helpful why you use that title, taking it as a play on, on other books and how other movements have been characterized in, in their in their you know in their birth and their in their decline um i wasn't sure if that was your idea or that was the publisher's uh idea for the title because it's very sensationalized it sounds very sensational the rise and fall of dispensationalism and, and as an academic dispensationalist i'm like like you just said i'm still here and i'm not the only one right i mean there there are still seven thousand that haven't <laughs> been the need about to bail yet right <laughs> uh, there's more than seven thousand of course but the idea is there is a there is a thriving scholarly dispensationalism that is that is still operating and the problem is uh most don't know where we are um and as i say in the book i come out swinging that first chapter i'm gonna say it right now i'm very clear on this there is without a doubt a total marginalization of dispensational scholarship within the broader evangelical community. That should go without saying the books that are published on dispensationalism, such as Dan's even, uh, by a notable Christian publisher, Erdman's, those are the books it's going to be a, some type of criticism of. It's not going to be any type of pro-dispensationalism, which is in God's providence. We're very thankful when our book, Discovering Dispensationalism, came out because it came out at the same season as, as Dr. Hummel's Rise and Fall of Dispensationalism, as well as uh, Brian Irwin, uh, After Dispensationalism, pu published by Lexham Press. These are critiques of the movement. And here ours is in the middle of it, giving a counterbalance showing doctrinal development. So hopefully it's giving some type of counterbalance because most books that are published on dispensationalism are not friendly toward it. It is going to be a critic, uh, a critique of it. And so you get the rise and fall of dispensationalism. It sounds sensational as, as, as Dan said, and, it, and it's clarified in his book, he's talking more about a scholastic dispensationalism isn't as prominent as it once was say in the mid 20th century with guys like Ryrie and Walverd and Pentecost and Alpha McLean. That is why in our book, we call that the golden era of dispensationalism, because it was such a, a large scholarly output at that point. However, because there is such a bias against dispensational thought now, frankly, our, proposal, our, our proposals aren't accepted in the most critical academic venues. I am active. I'm an active, call me a dispensational scholar, but I'm an active member of SBL, ETS, IBR. Um, I've published in these venues and for every acceptance I get, whether it's a conference presentation or a journal article or even a book review, I have like nine or 10, it seems like rejections before that one is accepted. Uh, and I'm certainly not alone. So what happens is we kind of retreat. Uh, 
is academic dispensationalism still in the country? Yes. And this is where I'd say where, where the concluding chapters of Dan's book, he does tend to think, and this is just my interpretation, you do kind of bring out some of the fr- what I call fringe, like things like the rapture ready clock and, and, and these people that do not represent a, a, a responsible dispensationalism, certainly not an academic dispensationalism at all. They send, they tend to keep, they, 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 they seem to get the focus toward the end as if that's where dispensationalism is going. When I look at me and my colleagues, what we do, whether we're at Southern California Seminary, which I appreciated the mention in the book, by the way, um, or other seminaries, Detroit Baptist Seminary, Baptist Bible Seminary, Shepherd's Theological Seminary, Master Seminary, Dallas Theological Seminary still. Then you got a slew of Bible College, Appalachian Bible College, and, and these other schools that are that are that are still Calvary University that are pumping out peer-reviewed journals from a dispensational perspective, whether it's the Journal of Ministry Theology, the Journal of Dispensational Theology at Tyndale, a Master Seminary Journal. Um, general biblical authority. I mean, these are these are peer-reviewed journals that aren't as prestigious as the big journals that we know of because they're not getting a hearing like these other journals. So when I when I see the when I'm hearing the fall of scholastic dispensationalism, uh, it, it's kind of a it's hard not to take slight offense to that because we are out there and we're publishing our stuff and and the idea is well, the popular version has overshadowed. The scholarly side to that point that Dan makes in his book, I'd, I'd have to agree it, it, it has, unfortunately, but we're still there. And I think a, when you're doing a historical tracing of dispensationalism, especially on a cultural side, you can't end it with these thinkers from decades ago and consider it now gone anymore. And I say in this in the, the trajectory of dispensational thought in the concluding chapter, I think the future is bright. Consider Lutheranism continues on without Martin Luther. Right. Calvinism continues on with John without John Calvin. Wesleyanism, Methodism continues without John Wesley. Dispensationalism is no more dependent on those 20th century thinkers, whether it be Walverd or Ryrie or Pentecost or McLean or going back to John Nelson Darby, uh, any more than 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 Anglicanism is dependent on King Henry VIII. Right. These these movements, these traditions are still there. They're still revol- They're still uh, um, um, thriving. And they are, you know, revising positions, perhaps, but they're still there. And I hope that in our book that comes across, at least in those final three chapters, we're shown with dispensational thought in modern America, it developed, it developed into different types of movements. And it's still there, whether we're talking about traditional dispensationalism, as some would call revised or classical, um, or progressive dispensationalism, which is, which makes the most inroads today within academic scholarship, um, or even mid-axe dispensationalism. It's, it's, there's, there's all these you know, fibers, different threads in the rope of how it's developed. And it continues to revise and reform according to how it understands these positions in scripture, still applying a consistent hermeneutic as best we can. So I would say, no, uh, scholastic academic dispensationalism has not fallen. It has fallen on hard times with those who are in positions to be able to publish academic dispensationalism because they simply will not do it. It's very rare for them to do it. Um, and I can say that from personal experience, and I'm certainly not alone in that, how many of our proposals get rejected in these venues. But scholastic dispensationalism, we're still there. Perhaps not as prominent in the 20th century. I've given a reason why, but we certainly are still doing our our scholarship, and that should be recognized, I think, in a book that's tracing the history and showing the trajectory of where we're going, um, which I think we include in our book, but unfortunately was missing in other books. Gotcha. That's, okay. That's re- can I Sorry. respond to that really quick? We're going to jump in, Dan. Yeah, let me let me go to you because he brought up a uh, mid axe dispensationalism. I doubt we have time to get to that, but go ahead, Dan. Yeah, well, just wanted to respond, and I um, uh, so my my sort of uh, cold hearted historian comes out and says, Corey, the experience you're having, where it's it's hard to get recognized uh, outside of certain circles, it's hard to get anything published. The really cold historian to me says that's what a fallen tradition looks like um it, it, that fall not not dead but that's what it looks like to be on the margins of academic discourse and i feel that as an evangelical in a uh uh well luckily in my subfield there's a lot of christians but i feel as a christian in a broader academic uh world that um uh, that doesn't really respect uh, christian scholarship i feel the same thing in a lot of ways and i i have no compunction saying um, I, I don't know if there ever was a rise of Christian scholarship in the modern secular academy, but we're certainly not anywhere close to uh, where we want to be. So that's my that's just one one observation. As I was reading your introduction, in particular, where this is how you start the book is talking about the difficulty uh, 
of getting um, a, a fair hearing, I guess is how you would call it um, in. Um, yeah, not not weighing in on the morality of that. It's like, yeah, that's what happens when when a, a tradition's not at the center is you don't get a fair hearing. You don't get access to the, the biggest publishers and things like that. Um, the other thing I would just say is um, I do end with a lot of pop dispensationalism. And I wanted to create that category in part not to conflate it with scholastic dispensationalism. And I think, I mean, this is a, I've, I've heard you say it here, I've heard others observe it, which is this frustration. If you are a, a thinking, um, even scholarly dispensationalist, the question is sort of why are we always defined by the left behind novels or why are we always defined by this cr these crazy things that um, are on you know, movies and stuff like that. I've tried to give an explanation for that. Like that, that's, that's part of the book is trying to say like, this is what happens or this is what happened. I, there's not a law to it, but this is what happened to dispensationalism, um, at least a, a version of it, which was popularized. It was simplified. It was reduced down to basically the end time stuff, uh, not much more. And that this, for the reasons I trace, which have to do with consumerism and politics and everything else, um, this is one of the fates of dispensationalism. So the, there was a play on the fall part, which is, uh, this is the one part of the book where I'm, uh, well, others will say there's all parts where I'm editorializing, but this is where I wanted to editorialize, um, which is say, I don't think this is a good development. I did not, I do not appreciate a lot of the pop dispensationalism, as I call it, including the ways that people who aren't even Christian invoke the rapture for their video games and movies and everything else. Um, I, I don't think that's really helpful either. But it, unfortunately, it is the world we live in where that is, I can't tell you how many people at a place like UW-Madison, they don't know a thing. They've never heard the term dispensationalism. They do know what the rapture is um, in some vague way because they, of a certain age, they read the Left Behind novels or something else. That was the question I really wanted to try to answer is how do you get to a place like that? And I don't want to blame it on John Walvoord. <laughs> I mean, he has a little uh, role to play, but it's actually all these other people that were popularizers um, that I think have a lot to say in the story. So I end with them because I do think for um, people outside of the, the halls of academia, um, that's what they think about when they think about dispensationalism. Last thing I'll say is I want to just say again, um, I take your criticism to heart about if I'm going to study the scholastic tradition, I should make sure to invoke some people who are still active in that tradition uh, at the end of the story. So I wish I would have done that. That would have that would have made the book stronger um, and particularly stronger for people like you who um, who can see yourself in the story uh, closer than others. Um, so, yeah, that's on me. And, and I hope in, in that um, future second edition that still is not actually real, but maybe someday that I can add, at least in that paragraph that that acknowledges um, some of the journals. I took even notes here, some of the journals and some of the actual uh, people uh, who continue to um, write within that tradition. No, I appreciate that for sure. And, and uh, I think it even probably bolster your, your, your method of, of analyzing people as yeah. opposed to beliefs, because there are people that are thinkers that are publishing scholastic, what you would call scholastic theology, whether it's Michael Vlock or Mike Spiegel, Ron Bagalke, um, you know, these guys, all the, uh, the, the authors of our book, they're all active scholars and professors and they write in other areas, just like I do dispensationalism, sort of my, my flag right now, but my theology is in my, my PhD is in John and a, a dissertation on John. I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in my research interest in Johannine thought and hermeneutical theory and dispensationalism as a result of a certain hermeneutic. So that's where I, that's where I start, uh, writing in areas of dispensational thought, um, but there's a lot of those scholars living today um, that are publishing scholastic dispensationalism that probably should be included in a history that's focusing on the people and the thinkers uh, within that movement. So I, I appreciate you saying that, Dan. And I will say this as a positive about your book. I, I, in fact, I even lifted a paragraph you said in, in some tweet or is that what we're still calling it? Tweet or, or X? I, I don't know what we call that. What do we call when you post something on Twitter now, what do you call it? An XE? I don't know, a tweet, whatever. <laughs> but there, yeah, there was there was something, in, and you made an excellent point, and I and I have repeated this already to colleagues and other dispensational thinkers that for a dispensational scholar, for any scholar, as a matter of fact, you have to you have to know your audience, and you have to, in a sense, choose a side. Are you going to remain scholarly? in your academics, or are you going to capitulate to what publishers want to do a popular level something? And you did bring out some, I would say, I would agree that were probably wrong moves from my side for guys like Charles Ryra and John Walvert, who published so much brilliant academic dispensational thought during that period, capitulated at times to 
what was geopolitically, you know, popular at the time and do some popular works and then try to jump back into the scholarly realm. You can't have it both ways, you know, perhaps maybe that's the lesson to be learned. Um, if you're if you're academic, making an academic case, you got to stay academic consistently all the way through. It doesn't mean that you can't write at a popular level. Josh and I were talking about that, how we want to be able to bless the church with our writings. You keep one church, one foot in the local church, one foot in the academy. Absolutely bridging that gap. But if you're making case for scholarly anything, you should remain scholarly and not capitulate to cultural trends for any type of marketing value or, or book sales. And that came out in, in, a, in a very uh, important way, I think, in the in the final, you know, toward the end of your book, which I really appreciated because it, it provides a good warning um, for those of us who do write and publish in the scholarship. It is a double, it is a double edged sword, though, isn't it? Dan, I know you and I were, were emailing each other back and forth. You know, when I would say maybe I'm whining uh, that we are uh, marginalized and there's a bias against us um, and the response could be, as you've said, well, that kind of proves the point because it's been overshadowed to such a point. And yet I would say, well, there is a bias because things have uh, of, have changed and people simply do not know where we are. We're still there. So um, give us a give us a fair hearing, perhaps. Um, but whether we're given a fair hearing or not, just like as you as a Christian historian, as a scholar, there's going to be those those bias, you know, and those against what we're we're publishing. And sometimes there's just no way to win that battle. What I want to make clear and what we want to make clear, myself and our, our co-editor and all the authors of our book, is that there is a historical pedigree to dispensational thought. Um, dispensationalism is not is not defined by one man or one doctrine such as eschatology or pre-trib rapture. Those are included within it. Um, it's certainly not dis defined, I didn't get to say this earlier, but by the amount of dispensations. I, I remember hearing that, uh, Dan, you may have defined dispensationalism with your conversation with Dr. Moeller by how many dispensations there are. That is an in-house debate. There are, I know dispensationalists that hold 12 dispensationalists, some hold a seven and some as little as three. And Darby was certainly not the first to come up with that. We can go into the division of time all the way back to the patristics, how they were dividing up human history. Martin Luther did it himself. Um, prior to Darby, there was there was a dispensational scheme and someone would even say a chart with Pierre Poiré in the 1600s uh, with his book, um, as well as the famous hymn writer Isaac Watts wrote a book on the harmony of all religions, which God prescribed to men and all his dispensations toward them. And he had a six or seven scheme dispensational uh, uh, plan, as did John Edwards in the 1600s, not Jonathan Edwards, but John Edwards also published a book, A Complete History on the Survey of Dispensations, 150 years before Darby hit the scene, right? So this goes all the way back to the sexta septa millennialists, if we call them that way, of the second century, the Epistle of Barnabas and Irenaeus and Hippolytus and Julius Africanus in the early third century and Lactanius divided up history, world history, according to these epochs. Might not be as neat as modern dispensationalists do, but that thought process was always there. Um, and so... We want to demonstrate the historical pedigree, but not that it's dead. It is still it is still evolving and still thriving, and there's still a future. Um, it would be nice to get a, a fairer hearing within the academy, but so be it. Just as a Christian, we're going to be <laughs> uh, marginalized in our scholarship. So I appreciate, Dan, your book and what you've done, and I hope that the ours helps maybe fill in some of the holes, perhaps, and just uh, advance the conversation. Yeah, guys, I want to thank you both because we do have to wrap up. There's so many topics that we could cover here. And I know you guys have a lot of a lot of uh, knowledge to bring to bear on those topics. But I want to thank you both. We're going to have uh, links in the show notes for sure to both of your books. Um, and I just want to thank you both for uh, an edifying conversation on my part, but also ironic and peaceable. And, and I appreciate you both. So, Corey, Dan, thank you guys so much for being on here today with me. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you guys Pleasure. both. Thanks for having us on. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Josh. It's great. I'm, I, one last uh, shill for you is I appreciate um, having the forum like this. Um, it, it it takes you know uh, the trust and a, a, a displayed send a displayed track record of ironic conversations for uh, these to happen. So appreciate the space you've created on eschatology matters. Thanks so much. Appreciate you guys both. Seated here at my right hand, the Lord to my Lord. Come and